So let me start and uh, welcome everyone to this webinar. My name is Alan Fraser. I'm the coordinator of the Core MD project. Um, and this is one in a series of webinars that we're holding regularly to discuss with colleagues the outputs from our project and to get advice and questions. All of the webinars are available on our website. I'm going to start by sharing my screen and just to highlight for everyone um, that at our website, you will find the whole series of webinars. And we do record them. You will get a mail from our organizer within a few days to tell you how you can review this. Um, all the participants are in lecture mode, so you don't have the setup to speak directly, but we really do welcome questions and we will monitor the Q and A um, to uh, make sure that we try and address all of them. What we ask you to do is to put the question in the chat box um, through the Zoom function, and we will try and answer all the points that are raised. Use that also if you have technical questions. And at our website, you will find out how you can subscribe also to regular newsletters. The CoreMD project runs only until the end of March next year, and so there will be many more outputs in the next few months. And this is the series of webinars that we've already had. I'll leave this for a few seconds. If colleagues are interested, you can use this QR code as a direct link to the URL that is listed at the foot of this slide. And you can see that we've already talked about a variety of subjects, including objective performance criteria, educational requirements, AI, and uh, evidence for high-risk cardiovascular devices from one of our large systematic reviews. Um, these are the um, topics that I mentioned. And now here is um, the program for today. We're going to be discussing pivotal clinical investigations of high-risk medical devices. What guidance do we need and by whom? And we'll start with a presentation from Petra Schnell Inderst from UMIT Tyrol. Uh, she's the lead of uh, the project in Core MD reviewing regulatory guidance, and she's an expert in health science and technology. Then we will have Giroud, um, for, sorry, secondly, we'll have Richard Holborough, who's head of clinical compliance at BSI in the Netherlands, one of the largest notified bodies in Europe. And then thirdly, Giroud McGoran, who's a medical officer in the Irish regulatory agency, HPRA. So Petra's give, going to give us her overview and review, and Richard and Giroud will give us their perspective from the point of view of notified bodies and a regulatory authority. And all these colleagues are in the core MD consortium, and I want to thank them for their active participation. Well, um, I just before we finish this introduction, I want to highlight the next webinar coming up early in December. You can get details on our website, and that'll be presenting a core MD IT tool for uh, automatically determining alerts and reports of high risk medical devices, with then the opinion from the European Medicines Agency and from the Danish Medicines Agency and from the European Commission. So I will st stop sharing, and it's my pleasure to welcome Petra Schnellindest, who's going to introduce the topic for us. Petra, the floor is yours. You're going to talk about um, what guidance we need and what is available. Thank you very much, Ellen. I first have to rearrange my screen a little bit. That's fine. Thank you. Please go ahead. Okay. So... Um, so I will provide you some results from our project uh, on the recommendations on study design of pivotal clinical investigations. And in this slide, I want to acknowledge the contribution of my colleagues, and I'm very grateful for the support of the people from, from the consortium that I have list, listed here on this slide. A couple of stakeholders involved in the European certification of medical devices 
could benefit from studies design recommendations. Manufacturers and clinical investigators are supported to produce uh, appropriate evidence, but also the institutions who have a role in advising um, or assessing clinical investigations within the MDR could, uh, could, be, uh, could be supported to do this uh, in a consistent way. We performed a systematic review of existing recommendations on design methodology for confirmatory pivotal clinical trials of high-risk medical devices. On the table on the right, the pivotal clinical investigation is located in the scheme of clinical development stages and design types in the pre- and post-market stage according to ISO 14155 on good clinical practice of medical device studies. We searched recommendations from national and transnational regulators of high income, high income countries, as well as from the International Standardization Organization. General guidance documents for high-risk devices or broader definitions, including high-risk devices, were included. With regard to device-specific guidance, we included guide, uh, guidance relating to cardiovascular and orthopedic high-risk devices and high-risk devices for diabetes, because this was the focus of the CoreMD project. Our goal was to compare and describe similarities and differences and to identify gaps. We structured study methodology in the following sub uh, subtopics for extractions. First, definitions of levels of evidence. This means explaining the validity, validity of study types and what might be considered sufficient validity. When is a clinical investigation needed and when not was a second topic. Further, um, the advice on appropriate choice of study design and methods general aspects of study design around the population intervention, comparator and outcome schemes, statistical methods and considerations of the context of use and the learning curve, and finally, all requirements for reporting the clinical evidence and the methods used. Now let's have a look on recommendations from regulators first. Overall, we found 30 guidance documents of regulators of high income countries. In this Sankey diagram, we have a rough overview. In the first column, we have divided the publication period between 2010 and 2022 into three periods. The second column shows the jurisdiction or source of the guidance document and uh, in the middle, we have listed all included guidance documents. And on the right, we have listed the topics addressed. Each document could contribute to several topics. Here, here you can see that most guidance documents cover issues around the PICO scheme and have also emphasis on how to report studies. But there is only few guidance on the level of evidence of studies. We will take a closer look at this in the next few slides. This table shows which topics were addressed in the documents issued by the European Commission, the Medical Device Coordination Group and Belgium. I don't want to go into detail here, but simply illustrate that there are still major gaps in key areas. Overall, uh, the, the guidance by the Medical Device Coordination Group focuses on four of seven topics, need for clinical investigation and e equivalence, reporting, general design uh, issues, but they are mainly outcome definitions and especially adverse events. The guidance mentions levels of evidence only in the context of clinical evaluation of legacy devices and it's not about um, evidence levels of single stud uh, studies. Further, we have uh, still valid the MEDEF uh, document on clinical evaluation, which was uh, published under the medical de device directives, but some parts 
have been uh, declared still valid, valid by the MDCG. And the topics there are need for clinical investigations and equivalence, as well general study design issues. And there's also there are also some validity criteria for studies there. Overall, most guidance documents come from the FDA. And here we find three documents containing important substance matter guidance on pivotal clinical investigations for high-risk medical devices. The design considerations for pivotal clinical investigations for medical devices is the most comprehensive document on the topic. Newer de developments in study design are considered with detailed guidance especially on Bayesian adaptive designs, which might help to reduce sample sizes and address uncertainty in elements of studies designed before the study has been started, uh, such as uh, the effect size or the variability of effect. Further, there is guidance to analyze and report different treatment effects that might occur in subgroups of the population and the issue of underrepresented subgroups in studies. And finally, we have also um, a document how patient engagement in planning a clinical investi uh, investigation can contribute to study design. So this is the guidance from other jurisdictions, mainly the International Medical Device Regulators Forum. They, and the, uh, the medical and the, the MHRA from the UK. And the closer look shows this, that the IMDRF covers nearly all topics, but it lists only factors to consider without suggesting details how or further explanations. The Therapeutic Goods Administration TGA from Australia focuses mainly on clinical evaluation. The document covers all topics and gives also device-specific recommendations for several orthopedic cardiovascular and other devices. It also contains a hierarchy of evidence, but there is only a short section on design of clinical investigations. And this section mainly refers to IMDRF documents and the MEDEF uh, 2.7. I have shown some slides ago. The guidance from Medicine and Healthcare Products Regula Regulatory Agency MHRA from the UK covered also many topics, but only very brief, and the document applies to all developmental stages and risk classes, and therefore it is not very specific on high-risk uh, medical devices and the pivotal clinical trial design. Over, over, over all jurisdictions, we have identified some gaps. Methods how recommendations are developed are rarely provided. A description of the process would generally, generally uh, increase transparency. But for device-specific guidance, it is very important that the current state of science is systematically integrated and that the methods how this was done are described. Further objective performance criteria have been recommended for established devices but there is no guidance how OPCs should be derived. The change in standard of care, different populations should be reflected and statistical issues may have to be further developed there. We identified the following gaps in the guidance under the medical device regulation. A hierarchy of study types in terms of validity, integrating new trial designs, is missing. Such guidance is planned as deliverable at the end of the core MD project. And further guidance on the choice of study design and statistical methods is missing. One identified gap, a guidance on reporting on the clinical investigation has meanwhile been addressed. And this guidance considered a lot of the consort statement. So let's go to the results on recommendations in ISO standards. 
we have included three general ISO documents and nine device specific and all device specific uh, guidance comes uh, is in the cardiovascular field. So, and for uh, six of the of the guidances, um, standard, standardization requests from the medical device for the medical device uh, regulations have been made. ISO 14155, the standard on good clinical practice of clinical investigations of medical devices, covers all non-IVD studies of all risk classes at all stages of clinical development. Therefore, recommendations are very general and rarely study type specific. But this ISO contains a nexus with reporting stru structures of the study protocol, the study report, and the investigator's brochure. Here are some, here are some examples for the very general nature of the guidance. Regarding choice of the study design, it is stated that important issues have to be, be derived from the clinical evaluation in this. So this is very general. But in the annex for the clinical investigation protocol, more details are demanded. Uh, for example, for uh, 17 items of statistical methods have, methods have to be specified there. So it's... Um, in general, very, uh, very general, but in, uh, in the annexes, there are more specifications needed. So let me draw the summary of guidance uh, in ISO standards first, before I show you uh, some examples. First, there is only a limited number of ISO uh, standards of device-specific ISOs on trial design. They show different degree of detail in the recommendations and differences in recommendations. For example, which study types should be used for a pivotal trial between stents and hardware. And th these differences seem to be arbitrary. And there is no method section in ISO standards and there it is un and therefore it is unclear how the current state of science was considered. So let me show here an example for heart valves, um, here you see the, the category, uh, category uh, which has been ex extracted. And when, he, when you compare here the recommendations for heart valves uh, for choice of study type with the recommendations for the other uh, five uh, standards on stands, grafts, and patches, so here you will see that in the choice of study type for the heart valves, for novel and modifications of well-established uh, devices, uh, RTT is demand, uh, RCT is demanded. Uh, whereas for established devices without um, modification, objective performance criteria are recommend, uh, recommended for the for the other devices, four ISOs only demand controlled multi-center trials with at least three sites and a justification if no control is used. So on the next slide, you also see that, for example, for a comparator, the, the Hardwolf ISOs ask for um, an active a control with comparative devices or an other active comparator. But, uh, whereas the most of the other ISO only relate to the very general uh, comment recommendation in in ISO fourteen one five five, so that this is dependent on the on clinically on the results of the clinical investigations. And the other thing is, I want to um, uh, make you aware of is that the annexes uh, are very important in this ISOs because they really spe specify all endpoints that should be used in the clinical investigation. And um, here also the heart valve ISO are very uh, much more detailed. They, uh, they um, describe all endpoints 
There is in the description of the stance graphs and patches, um, there is only a description of device effects of failure and clinical effects of failure, so adverse events. So this should show you that um, the, yeah, how these uh, recommendations are done is um, not very standardized at the moment. So we identified also several gaps for ISO. Um, so ISO 14155 applies to clinical investigations uh, in all development stage, uh, stages and to all risk cl uh, classes, and it's not aiming specifically to, uh, to pivotal st uh, studies on high-risk medical devices. There are guidance specific to high-risk devices Distinguishing more between established and new devices could be useful. Further, um, there is only a limited number with uh, clinical investigation recommendations available. So the question is, should we recommend to um, make more uh, such requirements in, in other ISO documents, or should the, this be a task for common specifications by the uh, MDCG? And the current state of the art must be reflected in device-specific ISO. At the moment, there uh, is no method section, and we think that systematic literature reviews are the state of the art to identify um, to identify also um, issues in trial define, uh, design, and special attention should also be. Um, paid to consensus statements from representative groups of professionals, which also give such recommendations. Methods for deriving recommendations were not described, and therefore is the question, should we have a common methodology for clinical investigation parts for device-specific ISO? Is this needed? So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy for questions. Thank you very much, Petra. And can I remind colleagues, uh, while you stop sharing your screen, that um, we ask you to put questions in the Q&A. Um, sorry. Um, there we are. Um, there was already one brief question which I can answer that all the presentations today will be available on our website afterwards if you want to look at the slides again. And Petra, thank you. You've done an extremely detailed report for our consortium, and that will be made public um, during the later stages of the project, which means within the next few months, so that all the detailed tables that you've prepared comparing regulatory guidance from the different types of groups will be available. And if I can also comment that one of the general principles behind our project is that we believe that methods of clinical investigation and evaluation and standards should all be based on scientific evidence. And the call that we answered from the Commission was indeed to recommend a hierarchy of methodologies. But people may be keen to know how you chose the particular um, uh, advisory documents that you have reviewed, because, for example, there are many more than 12 ISO standards on devices. So I wonder if you'd like to briefly mention the criteria that you used to select the 30 or more documents that you included in this very detailed analysis. So we included um, only implantables, and um, so there are not so many, and implantables, should be uh, the devices should be implantable. On the other side, uh, it should contain a recommendation on clinical investigation more than just referring to the general ISO. So, um, and after this was enough to throw out most of the more than I think uh, about 800 uh, standards we have screened. So, yeah. So you've answered my next question, which is that you screened a huge number and selected the ones that you've just summarized. 
And and your conclusion clearly is that there are gaps, particularly in detailed methodologies. So perhaps that's a good point to go to our second presentation from Rich Holborough, who works as head of clinical compliance for one of the largest notified bodies in Europe. And Richard, you're going to tell us or try to answer the question, what guidance the notified bodies need in this context? Please go ahead. Thank you, Professor Fraser, for, for that introduction. Yeah, so so and thank you to the committee for asking me to, to come along today to, to represent not just BSI, but Team MB, the, the uh, group of, of notified bodies that are supporting this project, and, and a great question for you to, to pose to us. So I think I'm just going to really start with the fundamentals of, of what the regulation is about and why we've had that uplift. And when you look at the first paragraph in the regulation, you'll see that it does talk about the need for a robust, transparent a more emphasis on predictable and sustainable regulatory framework for medical devices. And, and I think that's where, where guidance does help, is, is being able to provide a predictable um, uh, ecosystem for, for, for medical devices. And of course, really for us, uh, when you look at the regulation, it won't tell you specifically what the expectations are on a device. It won't tell you, you know, exactly how many patients are needed, what the primary endpoint is for a, for a valve, for example. Uh, that looks to to supporting guidance uh, that that should follow that and some discussions that I'll cover as part of this presentation around things like common specifications that are mentioned, but there is nothing specific. Um, and really, the the emphasis there is is for the manufacturer to to provide uh, the the level of evidence that they think is appropriate to the device under evaluation. It's for us as notified bodies to to agree on whether or not that um, that that level of evidence is appropriate. And what we use is the term sufficient clinical evidence. And that's mentioned within Article 611. And so the, one of the shifts that a lot of people don't realize is under the old regulatory system of the directives, we had lots of guidance. And again, lots of general guidance of the MedDev that, that Petra has mentioned about, particularly 271 Rev 4. And then 2016, that was the biggest, um, biggest change uh, to happen in, in medical device regulation, particularly clinical evaluation in terms of bringing manufacturers and notified bodies up to an expectation of, of what is expected, what is the science behind a clinical evaluation and what is that process. So under the regulation now, uh, notified bodies have to have uh, personnel that have clinical, relevant clinical experience. And under the, the old directives, we as notified bodies, we didn't need to employ people who were clinical experts. Uh, there was no actual legislative requirement. There were guidance documents saying that notified bodies should have these personnel supporting the assessments but now under the regulation. And this is important because it feeds into, into the presentation I'm going to do today. So as I said, the, the role of the manufacturer is to provide sufficient evidence and then the, the uh, role of the notified body is to verify that, that that evidence is in fact sufficient. What do we mean by the term sufficient? Well, for notified bodies, we're always looking at the quantity and quality of clinical data. And of course, that can be dependent on, on various situations. And of course, it depends on different regulatory scenarios as well. So today I'm, I'm going to talk about an example um, of, a, of a coronary stent to try and give some reference to, to how things might be different in terms of sufficiency and why there is this challenge for, for notified bodies. So under the regulation, uh, manufacturers can, can make a claim of equivalence. And essentially what they're saying in a claim of equivalence is that our device is, is identical pretty much to, a, to another device that's currently on the market. And so when they're claiming equivalence, they have to meet certain criteria. But of course, what they're allowing is the clinical data of the other device, they're often their competitor's device, for example, being allowed to enter into the clinical evaluation of their device. So they're leaning that data. So in that terms of sufficient, we would expect that if a device that they're claiming equivalence to has been on the market, that they will have longer term data, that they'll have real world evidence again to support it. So there is a mix there in a claim of equivalence, again, as to what is sufficient versus perhaps something that is brand new to the regulation uh, to the to the European Union, where perhaps there is no other similar devices. And that can be obviously a situation as well. The other thing to mention is, you know, when devices have been previously marketed, as I said to you under the directives, the, there was there was very um, little uh, clinical evaluation guidance, or I'm sorry, there was a lot of guidance, but actual lot lacking in terms of the regulation, in terms of what specifics were needed. So those devices that have been on the market 20 to 30 years, again, have that 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 track record of being on the market of often safe and effective. 
Um, and so they come to, to the regulation today. And what is sufficient? So sufficiency versus a new product on the market today, a new coronary stent versus a coronary stent that might have been available for eight or nine years on the market under the directives. Again, the notified body has to use its judgment in terms of deciding what is sufficient because maybe they weren't robust clinical investigations of which the MDR demands today. And we need to ensure that availability of medical devices continues. The other thing, of course, is novelty. When something is new, brand new to the market uh, with, with new materials, new, new drug agents involved, etc., that, that novelty may have never been previously marketed before. And of course, that brings along the potential of residual risk, the unknowns. So in terms of sufficiency there, if we take, for example, the Conry stent, might have a brand new drug coating that's never been used before. You know, as notified bodies, we are expecting sufficiency to mean higher quality and quantity versus devices that may be using um, drug coated or copying drug coated stents that have historically been there and, and there's evidence to support its use. And the other thing as well is device lifetime. Um, if, if we take, for example, um, uh, uh, this coronary stent and they do um, pre-market clinical investigations, the lifetime of a coronary stent may be somewhere between five to 10 years, for example, but are we really expecting manufacturers to do a pre-market study of 10-year period? So that, again, is a challenge because notified bodies have to find out where that threshold of sufficient is in, in terms of the, the amount of, of pre-clinical data or pre-market uh, data. So, for example, if somebody comes to us with a coronary, brand new coronary stent with a pre-market investigation of three years, is that sufficient? And we're always asking ourselves as 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 um as notified bodies you know are, are, is this sufficient so again the the role of guidance is, is important to try and guide us in these decisions that we make particularly in the complexity of each different medical device that, that we we deal with the complexities that go with the different regulatory pathways that exist in the regulation itself so again as i said you know when there is a lack of clear guidance and the interpretation of sufficiency for these devices it leads to a, a different interpretations because the manufacturer's interpretation with a lack of specific um, guidance to say that you need for this coronary stent, you need to have this primary endpoint and this volume of patients. The manufacturers are sort of leading in a, in a blinded situation of, okay, do we do this? And do we do this amount of patients? Do we hold back? Do we add this particular endpoint to the study? And they're always trying to gauge because notified bodies can't consult to, to manufacturers either. So there is this, this um, regulatory aspects as well that we're not allowed uh, within the regulation, we're not allowed to consult. So really you start off with a, a very um, unpredictable situation of manufacturers simply guessing what, what they think is sufficient. Obviously they have uh, appropriate input from their clinical experts in their, in their industry but ultimately it is a bit of a gamble. And then of course, then it comes along to what is sufficient because for us as notified bodies, what, are, what, what do we think is sufficient for that coronary stent? And again, now we've got two contrasting, potential contrasting opinions of what is sufficient in terms of that data. Under the new regulation, we have the European expert panels that are going to look at high risk medical devices, particularly those that are new to the market with novel uh, aspects or health or clinical impact aspects. And again, their interpretation of what is sufficient might actually be different to what the notified body and the manufacturer's situation is. And of course, notified bodies are, are designated by competent authorities. And so again, there are uh, multiple competent authorities or multiple designated authorities in, in Europe. And of course, that leads to, to potential different interpretation of what they think is sufficient. So the idea of the system being predictable and what we see in the first paragraph of the regulation does with, with a lack of actual specific guidance for, for all actors in the, in the um, situation leads to potentially difference of, of opinions. So, so when I was asked to present on, on this particular topic, particular topic I, I thought, well, actually, based on my previous slide, it's not what guidance to, to notify bodies need, but it's actually what guidance to all, all actors in the regulatory system need. So, for example, you know, one of the big areas that we, we always have to, to, to work upon is the, uh, the what is state of the art. And Petra mentioned this in, in terms of her presentation. When we're a notified body, we're always thinking about benchmarking. You know, is this device good as or equal to what is currently available? And that's what we have to benchmark. And when we benchmark that, we have to look, well, the manufacturer benchmarks that across what is available on the market. And it's for us to agree. But if all actors in the regulatory system know exactly 
what is the defined risk and performance criteria of a coronary stent, then everybody can be working together to try and make sure that we can deliver that predictable system that a manufacturer goes and does their clinical investigation that they know is going to be accepted by the notified body, that they know that the, the notified body knows that the Compton Authority or designated authority is going to, to, to support their decision, and also that the European expert panels agree. So, so those, those are really key, key um, aspects. And I put the definition of what is meant by state of the art, because a lot of people get that confused with the most exciting new novel technology, and that's not the case when we talk about um, regulatory. I think it's also important that that you know that uh, we all have guidance that guarantees sufficient clinical data from clinical investigations. Again, with that uh, that lack of interaction between a notified body and uh, and and the manufacturer or the the non allowance of that through through uh, the regulation that says that notified bodies should remain impartial and independent, and therefore we cannot consult. Then it, there is again that just that potential where we may find that without sufficient guidance to guide manufacturers to do correct clinical investigations that will meet the requirements of the notified bodies um, process, and again that that can lead to potential problems as well. Um, and I think it's also thinking about the the guidance that's needed in the post market clinical follow up phase. You know we. We often, as notified bodies, have to look at what are the the manufacturers' post market plans, their post market clinical follow up plans. How are they going to gather that data? So when you think about that coronary stent, where we may accept the first three years of data that something has a claimed lifetime of ten years, what are they actually doing in that seven years? And that can really help us as notified bodies to say, okay, well, if we can say that three years is sufficient, and you're going to do this post market study, that will again further support and and complement. Um, complement notified bodies and give the the, the decision um, sorry strengthen the decision of notified bodies and the problem we have as well is that notified bodies are all sort of working independently we're, we're private entities we have an association where we talk and, and share um, common messages but ultimately everybody's working independently and that can again without uh, clear direct guidance on devices that can really impact different decisions and again that affects the predictability of manufacturers um, getting to market so the regulation itself does talk about the, um, the the use of common specifications and common specifications are mentioned specifically in Article 61, and they talk about where there is a, an agreement on the on the clinical evaluation requirements of a device, including the expectations of clinical investigation results, etc. Unfortunately, there's there's they. they there is none that, that are um, specific to, to, to medical devices that, that have been published. There are some that are, are for non-medical uh, devices without an intended purpose. Um, these are Annex 16 devices mentioned within the, um, within the regulation. Um, but, but for actual medical devices, this is where, where we're lacking that. And the idea behind this, really, the common specifications, our understanding as notified bodies is that it would help to drive that transparency, predictable approach and would help all actors understand what the expectations are. And again, as I said, you know, when we looked at that first paragraph of what, what it says in the MDR, a common specification would, would help notified bodies. So I think it's important to mention as well that we see lots of guidance being issued by the Commission at the moment, particularly in the new concept of the new regulation. It's important that, that the guidance is specific, clear, doesn't duplicate what, what is being interpreted or sorry, provides inter clarity interpretation, but isn't duplicating other guidance. There is a, I think it's fair to say that his, um, uh, the amount of guidance published as a result of this regulation is now far greater than what was published in the years of the directives. So, you know, we've had a significant amount of guidance that's been published to support this regulation, which has only been here for, or effective for two years. So it's or two and a half years. So again, it's important when we think of guidance to really make sure it's meaningful and, and it supports the, the system and what, what the MDR is trying to achieve. So I hope that in, in that case, I've given you a bit of a, a flavor of what notified bodies would need or what the system would need as well. Thank you very much, Rich. And um, again, you're going to stop sharing your slides while we get ready for the next presentation. But I think you've confirmed what Petra told us, which is that there are gaps. And from your perspective, um, they contribute to the lack of predictability that all the notified bodies will give similar judgments on the same files if they were to see them, um, because they're applying the standards to the best of their knowledge, but they're doing it independently. So do you see a need here for central documents to be produced and do you think the
plethora of new MDCG guidance documents are providing that because to me they're quite general. Yeah, I think I think the principles of of clinical evaluation and the support and interpretation are there in the MDCG guidance, and, and I think clinical evaluation it, it gives it, I guess, the the foundation or the science of what is a clinical evaluation. But there's nothing there that that really provides us as as notified bodies to say I, to give a distinctive yes or no answer. And I think notified bodies are often criticised for using the catchphrase "it depends." And it really does depend, but to bring that certainty to, 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 to for medical devices to enter the market in the EU, if we had these these clear, direct guidance documents for specific device groups, it can only ever support uh, the notified bodies' decision making and provide that that calibration across notified bodies themselves. Well, thank you very much. We have a lot of questions, and I want to try and ensure that we have time to come back to them generally. But before we do that, we're going to hear from um, Gerard McGoran, who's a medical officer in HPRA, the Irish regulatory agency. He's in their medical devices division, and he's also a member of the Clinical Investigation and Evaluation Working Group of European Regulators. And I think, uh, Gerard, you'll tell us a little bit about what's happening and what's being developed. And then collectively, we can discuss where we should be going as a system. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fraser, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm very happy to give a presentation today on, on the MDCG uh, Clinical Investigation and Evaluation Working Group, or CIE for short. Um, <clears throat> I'm a member of that working group, and, and uh, I'm happy to describe its role within the European uh, regulatory system. So uh, today I want to uh, start by giving an, uh, an overview of the role of the MDCG CIE working group and um, I'll then explain the role of competent authorities in regulating clinical investigations and um, I'll give a description on some of the challenges we have faced as regulators and finally I'll give an overview of the uh, future guidance that we are developing to try and address these challenges. So uh, MDCG stands for the Medical Device Coordination Group, um, and this is a group that was created under the MDR. It is an expert committee that is composed of representatives from every EU member state uh, and generally represents the national competent authority uh, for that country. Uh, it is chaired by the European Commission, and the primary aim of the MDCG is to ensure a harmonised implementation of the MDR, um, as well as IVD or the in vitro diagnostic regulation. Uh, the MDCG is composed of 13 subgroups, of which CIE is one. Um, CIE uh, assists the MDCG in, in, in respect to the clinical requirements of the MDR. Uh, one of our key roles is to draft guidance on the clinical requirements, as well as giving proposals for uh, future clinical common specifications. Uh, within our activities, we engage very closely with external stakeholders such as clinicians, researchers, industry representatives, notified body representatives, and our interactions with them and their inputs help inform our future guidance. Uh, so <clears throat> national competent authorities play an important role in regulating clinical investigations of medical devices um, in order to help researchers and sponsors understand the regulations. Uh, a lot of competent authorities will give guidance both at an EU level through CIE and MDCG, but also on a national level. And um, for example, uh, competent authorities such as the HPRA offer pre-submission meetings to uh, sponsors and device innovators who are hoping to uh, develop and, and conduct a clinical investigation. In the pre-market setting, uh, pre-market clinical investigations of non-C-marked medical devices generally need to be authorised by a uh, competent authority before starting. Uh, this applies to first-in-human studies, early feasibility studies, as well as pivotal studies um, of, of non-C-marked devices. In the post-market setting, uh, a researcher Sorry, if researchers want to conduct a, a clinical investigation on a CE marked medical device, they generally don't uh, need a full assessment from the regulator, but instead they might need a notification as a PMCF investigation or post-market clinical follow-up investigation. Uh, this only applies to devices that are being used within its intended purpose. Um, so if you plan on conducting a study of a CE marked device that's outside its intended purpose, that generally needs a full assessment and authorization from the regulator. Um, there are some situations where uh, a post-market investigation may not need regulatory review, uh, and this is dependent on national laws. So in general, we advise uh, if 
that if you are planning on doing such a study uh, uh, in the post-market setting, it's a good idea to contact your national competent authority to give it, to get advice from them on their own national requirements. For ongoing clinical investigations, uh, sponsors are required to report any safety incidences or serious adverse events to the competent authority as they occur. Um, the regulator will then monitor the sponsor's activities, make sure that uh, what they are doing to investigate uh, these SAEs is appropriate uh, and to ensure that there's still an acceptable level of safety in the study. Um, if necessary, the um, the regulator can conduct site inspections uh, on individual investigational sites. And if a sponsor wants to make a substantial change to an ongoing clinical investigation, uh, generally that needs an application and review from the um regulator as a substantial modification. Uh, finally, once the study is completed, a sponsor is required to provide a clinical investigation report and summary to the regulator for their review. And that uh, summary is then placed on a central database or will be placed on a central database to call Udemed once it is set up. So uh, when we as regulators review clinical investigation applications, our, our main question is uh, that we ask is, are the study's potential risks justified when weighed against the potential and expected clinical benefits? Um, I've included a list of, of the key aspects that we focus on when we're assessing clinical investigations. Um, generally, these requirements are reflected in Annex 15 of the MDR. And uh, in general, we recommend to uh, researchers and sponsors who are, who are looking to develop a clinical investigation that they should familiarize themselves particularly with Annex 15 of the MDR as it gives quite useful granular detail on the requirements uh, for clinical investigations from a procedural and regulatory perspective. Um, so regulators, so moving on to the challenges, uh, regulators like like everyone have faced significant challenges since the implementation of, of the MDR, the medical device regulation in 2021. Um, a big challenge for us has been uh, that we have been tasked with in CIE is, is to address um, is to is to address how are we going to create and sustain a medical device environment that is safe for both patients and users. It's predictable for all parties. It's transparent and it's supportive of, uh, of innovation. Um, and that the laws are scientifically founded, and uh, which is, I think, an em emphasis of CoreMD, as as, as uh, Professor Fraser mentioned. And is it implemented in a fair and proportionate way for all devices? And is it being consistently applied and implemented um, in a harmonized fashion across the EU? For CIE, pardon, for CIE specifically, um, there are some key areas of, of significant challenge that we face. Uh, one challenge, uh, uh, that has been around the need to generate more scientific guidance. And as Petra alluded to and, and, and highlighted, a lot of the guidance that, that we have created within the EU to date has been very much procedure-based, has been um, much more about documentation and reporting. And we acknowledge there's definitely a need for more granular, scientifically-based uh, guidance for, uh, for, not, for including both for individual clinical investigations, but also for the clinical evaluation of devices in general. Uh, within that, there is a need for guidance from regulators um, on how to determine sufficient clinical data, both in general and for specific devices. As, as Richard explained, um, the nuances to this topic are, are quite significant. Um, there's also a need to develop other avenues of giving scientific advice, such as from expert panels uh, for manufacturers of high-risk devices that are at the beginning of their clinical development planning stage, as well as uh, exploring that, that balance, as, as Richard mentioned, where, no, where is it balanced that notified bodies can give, can appropriately give guidance through structured dialogue versus, you know, trying to balance that with the restrictions on consultancy and, and, and those, those requirements. Another challenge that we've faced is just the sheer diversity of of devices that fall under the MDR. The MDR itself is, is very broad and covers all medical devices, but it doesn't, as we've mentioned, it doesn't give much significant or much specific guidance on certain special cases, for example, orphan devices and, and pediatric devices. Um, it could be extremely challenging for uh, orphan devices to um, that are used in rare diseases uh, to, to generate pre-market clinical data. Um, so one of our challenges is to try and develop guidance that is compliant with the MDR, but acknowledges those specific cases. Uh, in the short term, we're focusing a lot on device specific guidance for some of these cases. And the aim into the medium and long term is to develop more clinical common specifications, um, as, as uh, Richard had mentioned. Uh, it is important to acknowledge that obviously developing these clinical com common specifications will require a, a, a 
quite a specific set of clinical expertise and technical expertise uh, because often they will be device specific and um, so that is its own challenge to to recruit and identify those experts to help in creating uh, these guidances and, and common specifications there's also a need to de develop uh, guidance on how to define state of the art both in general and for specific devices um, harmonization of the implementation of the MDR has been very challenging. Uh, we operate in a very decentralized system. So while there is on, while there is one MDR regulation and one IPDR regulation, it applies across 27 EU member states. And as such, the MDR is, is vulnerable to up to 27 uh, different interpretations you know, in some sections. Um, so one of the challenges that we face is to create and ensure that we create consensus in understanding from a regulatory perspective. And that's what a lot of the, our guidance um, focuses on. But once we even create that guidance and then release it into the public, it then enters another decentralized system uh, with, with over 30 notified bodies in MDR who then read it and then they interpret it. And inherently, with all of these stakeholders, including the manufacturers, the more people involved interpreting it, the, the less predictable it, it, it becomes. So that can be quite challenging. It's something we, we deal with every day. Um, another challenge is around uh, combination studies. So these are studies that are both clinical investigations of medical devices, but also say, clinical trials of, of investigational medicinal products or drugs, and sometimes in combination with performance studies of IBD devices. So in those situations, uh, one study could fall under three distinct regulations, MDR, IBDR, and the clinical trials regulation, CTR. Um, so that that can be extremely difficult for for researchers and, and sponsors to try and navigate. So that is a, a challenge that we're that we're trying to address. Um, in addition, uh, we are creating uh, when we're creating guidance, we do need to be conscious of other global markets as as well as international guidance, say from from IMDRF uh, and international standards. So all of these uh, uncertainties they directly impact on the predictability of the European market. Um, and the hope is that if we can address these challenges, that they will have a knock on effect to improve the predictability and uh, from a certainly from a clinical perspective. So future guidance, uh, my, my final slide. So um, I want to give an overview of some of the future upcoming guidance regarding um, clinical investigations and evaluations. So firstly, there uh, we are very near the point of publication of our first revision of MDCG 2021-6. Uh, this is the Q&A document for clinical investigations. Um, it's, it's undergone a, a significant revision. There are 19 new questions that, that are answered. There's also clarifications on 13 existing questions. Uh, and I'd be very hopeful that a lot of these uh, new questions will address many of the common questions that, that we see from researchers and sponsors uh, that, that, that have problems with, with it. Um, we are also near the point of completion guidance on a uh, clinical investigation plan and and investigators brochure uh, on, on what you know, what they should what information they should include. Um, earlier this year, CIE worked with the Commission to develop specific guidance on the Clinical Investigation Summary Report, which is available online. Uh, we are also nearing completion of guidance uh, regarding mandatory clinical investigations for high-risk devices, which is outlined in, in Article 61.4. Um, so we're, we're, and we're also carrying out other work uh, to give more specific guidance on the requirements for pilot versus pivotal clinical investigations. Uh, for clinical evaluation, there's a huge amount of, of work being done, uh, which is led by our colleagues in Italy on, on updating the clinical evaluation guidance on MedDev 271 that Richard mentioned. Um, so there's a huge amount of work in, in aligning that to MDR, because that was based in the directives in the past. Uh, we are using this the opportunity to incorporate more scientific guidance into that revision on how to conduct clinical evaluations. And we're focusing on the concept of scientific validity of data. And we're giving examples and recommendations on different methodologies on say for literature search, for appraisal techniques, for analysis methodologies. Um, so hopefully, uh, Th this more scientific guidance will, will allow uh, for a bit more predictability uh, and justification for manufacturers and notified bodies when they're trying to understand that concept of, of sufficient clinical data for specific um, devices. We're also giving more guidance on the life cycle evaluation, particularly that post-market, the PMCF investigations, the role of registries, the role of, um, of, of real-world data. Um, there are some device-specific guidance documents that are, we're focusing on. As I mentioned, uh, orphan devices are a priority, and, and there's a huge amount of work underway with that to develop specific clinical uh, guidance on that. 
And we're also setting up a new work package that is looking at the outputs from Core MD's work uh, with a view of seeing which outputs can can inform the development of future guidance on, on specific devices, for example, AI devices. Um, there is a pilot ongoing with uh, EMA expert panels on giving clinical advice to manufacturers in that early part of the device development. So hopefully that can be expanded in 2024. Um, and there's also a new EU Horizon uh, 2024 uh, fund for a new project. Uh, and the, one of the key aims of this is to pilot the development of clinical common specifications, uh, as well as uh, giving specific guidance on and defining the state of the art for, for several both medical devices and IBD devices. And I think that that project will help an awful lot in paving the way for us to efficiently uh, create uh, common specifications going forward. Uh, we're working on improving the harmonization of CI regulation through including, uh, including through the work of of developing a coordinated assessment procedure amongst regulators. There's a new, the new combined project is looking uh, to, to uh, align and make a more streamlined and compatible process for those combination uh, drug and device products. Uh, and finally, work continues uh, in, in MDCG to improve the, the global harmonization or, or, or acknowledge the global harmonization harmonization by the use of harmonized international standards is appropriate, as well as engage, engaging with international partners such as IMDRF. So um, thank you very much uh, for your uh, for your time. I hope that's been informative and I, and I hope that you will see the, the work we are doing. We are facing significant challenges, but, but um, I hope that you will see that with the amount of work we're doing, I am optimistic that a lot of this guidance will help address some of that uncertainty and, and improve predictability. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll stop sharing and open back to the floor. You're muted, Alan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Geroid. And we've had a lot of questions which we will do our best to answer. So could I ask you to give brief responses as much as possible? Um, uh, Geroid, let me start with you because there are a couple of fairly specific questions. When will the MDCG Guidance 2021-6 revision be available? Because that's perhaps the first that's going to appear. Um, my understanding is it, it, it's expected by the end of this year. So in December, it's it's we've been moved for final endorsement. So it's very very near completion. So I, I would be optimistic and say by the end of the year. And uh, there was another question asking about um, the timing of release of the various documents, and it's impossible for us to answer each one at the moment. But perhaps another very important one is the revision of the previous guidance on the directives on two seven one revision forward to dated from 2017. And I understand that the first part of that might be available next year, but that it's not even gone for public consultation yet with stakeholders and attendees at the Medical Device Coordination Group. So do you know when the revised EU guidance on clinical evaluation will be available, please? Yeah, so I, I'm the plan is again, as you said, certainly by 2024 will be the first um, first release within 2024. Um, it's taking a bit longer to go through the, that revision, but a lot of that is 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 adopting much more scientific um, guidance. I think it'll be more useful rather than getting it out quick. We're trying to want to get it done right, um, but there's a huge amount of work that the group and particularly Sylvia in uh, within. From our, our challenging colleague, Silly Champia, is, is leading a huge amount of work to do this. So um, I would be hopeful that it'll be pub going out to public consultation within Q1 of 2024. Uh, and then I'll be asked, I, I, I know that we're aiming to try and get it done certainly within the first half of 2024, if not the end of it. But uh, that is a huge priority for us. It's a very high priority. We're just trying to get it done. And the other, um, the, the person who asked the question is anonymous. But I think we can say that the time, the the, the sorry, the work program of CIE is publicly available with all the different tasks, if I'm not mistaken. And is that correct? And people can see what the regulators are working on. I believe it is. Yeah, I, I think you you can access it through the European Commission website. Yeah. Yes. So the Europa website of the European Commission will keep people up to date. Now, um, let me go to one of the other questions. And perhaps start with a question from David Epstein, which um, was that there seems to be missing from the system the idea that all actors can learn from experience. Um, maybe, Richard, you could start this. Is there anything that notified bodies can do to 
publish their reasons for a particular decision based on the evidence presented? How can notify bodies share information with each other and start to standardize their recommendations? I think you've been involved in setting up a group to discuss this now from clinical assessors. Perhaps you could share some of that information for us. Yeah, certainly. There's there's two aspects to consider. You know, there's uh, Team MB has got together all the notified bodies, produced a best practice guidance on on the submission that includes both clinical and technical documentation. Um, we also now are, are opening up our training to to manufacturers so they can come and listen to what the training that we provide to other notified bodies. Um, because that's in a, in a group setting with multiple notified bodies, we're not specific, obviously, on the device that the manufacturer has, etc. But certainly the Clinical Experts Forum meeting um, is, is a meeting of all clinical experts at each of the Team MB members. And now we've opened it up to other net notified bodies who are not members of the Team MB because it's been so successful um, and to try and calibrate on expectations. So there we do discuss things such as you know, expectations for maybe a certain device uh, between us. We might even go into the, the interpretation of the regulation and try to gauge what, what mo- most people's uh, interpretation is. So there is that, that action. The problem we have as, as, as individual notified bodies sharing that information about our, our decision making is the fact that, that we are um, private entities and we do deal with, with commercially sensitive information that we're contractually obliged to keep confidential. So that there is a there is that that remit there. But I think Team MB certainly is trying to find the common um, occurrences or common issues that we see in the system with with manufacturers and trying to share that through things like best practice guidance documents, training, etc. that people can pick up on. Thank you. So you've started an informal collaboration between notified bodies, and there is hope that that will develop in future. What are the prospects for you starting to publish a Q&A between you? Because I believe, and this is probably not formally announced yet, so I hope I'm not um, jumping any guns, but I believe that the Commission are going to encourage um, discussion uh, with notified bodies on an, on a non-personal basis on general questions that would then be available to all the stakeholders and all the manufacturers wanting to make applications in Europe. Is that correct? You've probably been party to some of those preliminary discussions. Yeah, so that there's two, two aspects to consider. There's, there's the first part, which is the, the what, what uh, Gear had mentioned around structured dialogue. So there's a because of the system issues at the moment under the regulation, there was a guidance document produced called MDCG 22-14, which talks about the capacity constraints of notified bodies. But I think it's the system, if I'm honest, it's not just notified bodies. In one of those, there, there is a, a look at trying to get notified bodies and manufacturers having these structured dialogues, which aren't deemed as consulting, but a formal process to exchange views, provide information that, again, helps that predictability and helps manufacturers get their MDR certificates. The, Thank you. Okay. Um, we need to <laughs> probably go on because of time, so sorry to interrupt you. Um, let me go on to some of the questions about the content rather than the the, the review methods. And um, there's a question about whether or not a randomized controlled trial should be considered as a pre-market investigation for new devices, or would a single arm study be deemed sufficient for conformity assessment and therefore CE marking? Um, Petra, maybe I could ask you whether the documents that you've seen provide an answer to that question, and then Giroud, if he has an answer, if he was advising a regulator, uh, advising a manufacturer for a new device when they might need to do an RCT. So at least from the regulator side um, and also from some ISO, uh, usually um, the best evidence should be provided. Uh, For example, also from the TGA, they say that. So usually that would be an RCT for, especially for a novel device. So I think, but then there come the exceptions, let's say, but I think you you can't uh, give there a general um, overview what what kind of exemptions there are because uh, yeah. But there isn't currently specific European Union guidance, is there? No, I, uh, not I, really. No, and that's the gap that we've been asked to start to provide advice from collectively from our consortium. 
Um, Giro, do you have a perspective on when an RCT should be done? Yeah, I suppose it. To the, to, the, to the point of the question about whether a single arm study is appropriate, we generally see single arm studies more more to do with the, those sort of earlier pilot studies, first in human or, or early feasibility studies. And they are really important sources of data, particularly from a safety perspective. But um, one of the key aspects with demonstrating sufficient clinical data is is often having to try and find an appropriate comparator comparing, a, a, you know, a, a, to a, a sort of a standard of care or state of the art uh, comparator. The, one of the most robust ways to do it is with a randomized control trial. But I mean, on the, from a legalistic perspective, the MDR does not specify that a randomized control trial must be done pre-market. And there are, you know, and it's definitely foreseeable that there are other appropriate uh, clinical study designs that could be used that otherwise assess comparators you know it, it, depending on the device a crossover study or case control or cohort studies or other non-randomized studies might be appropriate um, and again this goes back to the different considerations say for orphan devices it might pre- be very challenging to develop a, a large-scale robust pre-market randomized control trial so that might be something that may be taken into the post-market setting um but yeah so i suppose that we're, we're, we'll hope to be able to give a bit more guidance on that within the clinical evaluation uh, guidance update thank you and i think i could answer perhaps personally one of the questions a short question about elaborating on advice that the expert panels are giving um, i think the european medicines agency is conducting as we heard a pilot exercise to give advice to um, manufacturers with new devices. And that's being very carefully evaluated and will be reported after the first 10 studies. They'd had, I think, more than 30 applications from manufacturers and selected 10, and they will produce a report on that. And then that system will become ongoing. Um, For the panel uh, advice for standard applications that come from the notified bodies, there have been a relatively small number of reviews uh, put through the whole system, and they are being published, um, and there will be a review in due course. But the question is getting at how the panels give advice, and they have not yet given advice on trial methodologies in general or contributed to European standards, although that function is envisaged for them. And the European Medicines Agency is also now setting up educational or training um, or in-house sessions for panel members to understand the regulations and to apply them as uniformly and to the highest standard possible. So would anyone like to disagree with any of the answers that I've given, or do you agree with that? Um, Thank you. So uh, uh, let me go on to try and summarize several of the questions together, which is pointing out how difficult it is for manufacturers and others to interpret all the different types of standards and regulations that we have. MDCG guidance documents, common specifications, ISO standards, and so on. And let me try and summarize this and then ask your question about it. Um, ISO standards are voluntary, but they become legal documents in Europe once they're harmonized and become sen senelec documents. They become approved. But I think they're still voluntary standards. You could clarify the legal status of that. Common specifications are a special category within the European Union and they're legal documents. And once they're approved, then manufacturers who meet the standards of a common specification um, by default have demonstrated that their device meets the standards required for a conformity assessment. But there are, as we heard, extremely few common specifications. Most of them actually relate to class D in vitro diagnostics. And so there's a gap there. And then we have MDCG documents, which are voluntary guidance again. So is it fair to say, and this is a message from this whole session, that despite all these documents, it's still really unclear which one is the one we should go to for definitive standards on trial methodologies and statistical methods and so on within Europe for a particular class of device. 
And if I can preempt a conclusion, that's where in future um, clinical and scientific communities really need to help the regulators to construct a new ecosystem where there are publicly available standards that meet this gap. Um, Petra, is it fair to come to you first? Because you know the literature on this subject now probably almost better than anybody after your long report. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> I came up with the question who should address this because I'm, yeah, I'm an academic and not so familiar with all the regulations and and um, the meaning. So I would say uh, what, so my I also was uh, confused how this could be implemented because there are so different uh, actors in the, in the in the whole regulation and as richard uh, showed that uh, there is also the 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 point that uh, notified bod bodies con cannot consult uh, their uh, clients yeah so i would just forward the question to <laughs> to gary and uh, and richard because um, yeah so who would I like to go dead. first yeah <laughs> We go to you first, uh, Richard, please. Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, um, yeah. I think uh, to, to to think of the point of of where we need to be uh, in terms of of it needs to be sort of uh, you've got all these different actors trying to achieve what I think is the same thing. You know, to me, a clinical evaluation is not a regulatory topic; it's a science subject, and we're all trying to prove the same thing. And what we need to have is 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 a convergence of, of all regulators sitting in one room and saying this is the way forward. Um, and yet, you know, there will be things that Europe wants, and that you know that 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 will come out in a common specification that perhaps um, that the FDA, for example, would accept on a standard. But so I think what we need to have is is a baseline of what everyone um, should agree to in terms of a clinical evaluation for a specific device. And then we'll always have these due restrictions who will have their preferences because of one reason or another. And that's where, where perhaps things like common specifications play in. But it's a, it's it's an interesting question. But uh, but yeah, maybe Giroud has some, some additional but I, thoughts. I would take up the comment that you've just made that actually we need convergence as well. And I very much doubt if any manufacturer would disagree that the ID <laughs> system would be similar standards based on scientific evidence and balance between evidence and risk in each regulatory jurisdiction and the european union should be working with others to fill the gap jointly i would suggest uh, i know this is a long-term perspective but uh, Girard, let's ask you for your opinion about how to balance all the different documents that we have and where europe should be going with producing more clear recommendations on methodologies well i think that's that's the key i think it, it, right historically, as as I mentioned, a lot of our guidance has been procedural and regulatory based, sort of almost bureaucratic sometimes. Uh, and I think the emphasis needs to be more on on scientific and and technical uh, guidance going forward. And if you base it on well recognized, internationally recognized scientific principles, inherently, I think you're going to find your guidance will naturally converge with other markets and other systems that are that are also thinking in a scientific way obviously we have limitations in how much we can globalize our requirements because the mdr is the mdr and, and if you ask the question what is the one what is the one thing that you refer back within europe it's the mdr you have iso you have harmonized iso you have mdcg guidance you have all directive guidance ultimately it is it is down to the medical device regulation and ivdr for for um for in vitro diagnostic devices. Um, but I think if we can build as MDCG uh, on, you know, building on developing scientific uh, grounded objective uh, guidance, I think that will make it more uh, predictable and will make it, uh, and I think inherently will, you can you can easily transfer those principles over to other markets, which should help make it easier for, for manufacturers and others. Excellent. Well, thank you all for your excellent contributions and for the good discussion. Um, to those who've asked questions that um, maybe we haven't addressed specifically, I think we've touched on the topics of most of the remaining questions. So thank you for that. Um, and um, I would like to remind everyone that the next Core MD webinar is next week. It's on the 5th of December, and we'll be returning to the issue of how to find evidence about medical devices, but particularly to present 
a very interesting and effective new search engine that the consortium has developed for identifying reports and issues relating to devices that have already been approved. So I hope you'll join us then. And thank you for joining us today. And good night, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye now.